All right, so we are back in the tin can full release version. And today I'm going to make a video where I'll show you how to get survival times of an hour plus if you are playing in the ranked mode. Tin can, I played this game first when it came out into early access release. It's actually the very first video that I uploaded onto this channel, the review and my initial tips and tricks videos for this, which is about a year and a half ago. Um, and it is now in its full release state. I loved it back then, I still love it today, and I think it's a really great game. And I'm just gonna take you through a couple of things that if you practice will make it a lot easier for you to get up to, like I said, an hour or an hour plus survival times. Uh, it's gonna be split into three sections, this uh, tips and tricks video. So I'm gonna start out just by talking about pod prep, how you prepare yourself for all of the events that you're going to go through. Uh, after that, I'll go into specific events. So I'll talk about how you can deal with each event. And finally, we'll talk about some specific uh, systems and other things that you can do that's also gonna help your survival times. Now, before I get into it, I do wanna say that keep in mind, this is not the only way to play. I'm sure that there are people out there that can survive for longer than I can. This is just what's worked for me, what I've learned in the time that I've played this game. But let's get straight into the pod prep then. So a couple of things that you wanna do. First of all, you wanna switch off any systems that you don't need to use all the time. So this would include things like the pressure generator. You don't actually need to have this functional except for specific events where you may need to get the pressure back to the right levels by adding or removing nitrogen from the air. So you can switch this one off and in general, there are a couple of systems. So this is one of them. Uh, this is another system that you should have switched off the battery charger. You'll see when I get to the electric nebula why this is important, because it's very easy to miss some of these systems and not switch them off when you get into the electric nebula. And that'll definitely leave you in a difficult position because you'll potentially lose the systems completely. So that's another one that you can switch off. Um, the other one that you can switch off is the repair station. And I'll get back to this point, but I don't actually use the repair station this much uh, or that much. It's one of those things that I think new players think that you have to use it all the time, but there are actually more efficient ways of doing things, um, even though there are a couple of scenarios where you may want to use it. And then finally, there's the emergency lights. You don't need this. You can just work off the main lights. And of course, you do have a flashlight as well for emergencies. So while we're on the emergency lights, I also want to make it clear that I think this is still the case in the game that a component can get damaged only if it is installed in a system. So since you're not going to be using the emergency lights really ever, you can just take all of these components out. Um, we're just going to drop them on the floor for now, but this is just giving you a bunch of spare parts that you can use uh, in cases where something else breaks. And again, we'll get back to this, but that's why you don't need to use the repair station so much. So uh, you obviously you have these drawers and you can just sort of file these things in here. Um, I'm not gonna do all of that now, but that's generally what you would do uh, just to tidy things up a little bit within the pod. Uh, so that's one part of the pod prep. And um, the other thing that you obviously want to do is to make sure that you switch these out. So the oxygen bottle um, is never gonna be full when you start the game. And uh, likewise, the CO2 bottle is not gonna be completely empty. Uh, so you just wanna switch these out. Uh, you need to do this regularly and always make sure that you clean out this air filter as well. Um, the pressure generator also has an air filter, filter that you can clean out, but you're gonna not have to do that as often just because, as I said, most of the time you don't need to use that system. Now, the next thing that you wanna do is get rid of batteries and all of the systems where you don't need to have the systems always operational basically. So there's a number of systems like this. The pressure generator is the first one. Uh, the next one is actually the oxygen generator. And this may seem a bit paradoxical, but I'll get back to this point when we talk about surviving the electric nebula, um, that you don't actually need this system. You can completely disable it if you want to, and, and we'll get back to this. The CO2 system, generally it's a good idea to leave the battery in here. This system always needs to be operational. This is the one system that there's just no other way to get rid of carbon dioxide other than venting it out through this uh, airlock. And of course you don't wanna do that because you'll lose the rest of your air as well. Uh, and that's gonna cause a number of issues. So 
CO2 system, that one always needs to be operational. Um, CO2 to O2, you can take the battery out of here as well. It doesn't have to be running all the time. You only need to have it running some of the time. A repair station for sure, you don't need the battery in here. You can always put batteries back into these systems when you need to use them, but keep in mind, any component that's installed in a system is susceptible to damage. Um, then we have the same thing with the uh, main computer. You can switch this off if you want to, but it currently has two big benefits. The one is that it warns you of upcoming events. The other one is that it helps you to see if something's broken on a system exactly what the error is without having to go and look up the error codes in the pod technical manual. Um, this one, you can decide if you want to take this battery out or not. The temperature management system is one of the systems that you don't always need to have it running, but there are certain situations that you can't get out of without using the system. So it's maybe not the worst idea to have a battery in here as well. Um, and then the last one, unless I've missed anything here and hopefully not, is actually the battery that's in this system. This is a high capacity battery. Um, so it lasts a lot longer in other systems. Of course, the gravity generator does take a fair amount of power. You don't need gravity when the power is out. Yes, it's going to slow you down a little bit. It's going to be a bit more cumbersome, but it's not an essential system. So it's fine to have the battery out of there as well. Now, this brings me on to the events, and I'm going to start with the one that is going to catch out most new players. So if I go in here, you can see the various events and the electric nebula can be devastating if you don't know how to deal with it. So what happens is as soon as you get the warning for this, um, you're going to have a little bit of time before the first lightning bolt hits the pod. Uh, and when the pod does get struck, essentially any system that is connected with one of these power connectors is susceptible to get overloaded while it is switched on. So two criteria needs to be true for this to happen. One is that the on off button is switched to on. And the other one is that the power connector is connected. If both of those are true, the entire system can get fried. I think you can get fires as well. Um, so the way to get around this is as soon as this event starts, you basically want to start going around the pod and just switching off all systems and then re-enabling systems that are critical. So the way I would generally do that is I start with the lights because as soon as I switch this off, I can just see the little green lights that are still switched on. And this also is why it was useful at the start to switch off systems like this one, which you could easily miss. Um, just so that when the electric nebula comes, you don't have so many systems to run through. So we're quickly going to do that. So we're going to switch off these systems, uh, get this one switched off as well. Uh, that switched off, that switched off. Um, this is going to start uh, an error up here with the main generator because now it's generating more power than what's being used. Uh, so we're just quickly going to switch off the main generator as well. And then we're going to get down to the gravity generator and we'll also get rid of that. So switching this off. So now the pod is safe, it can't get damaged. But of course, you have two problems now. The one is that you're not pulling CO2 out of the air. The other one is that the pod is going to be losing temperature. So we're going to deal with the CO2 first. You should always deal with that first because that becomes a problem really quickly. And you can quickly fix this by just opening this up getting rid of the power connector and switching the system back on. So there we go. Now CO2 is taken care of. Um, always just clean the air filter here. And then you'll see that, where is this panel actually? You can just monitor this panel from here. So here you can see, okay, O2 is getting a little bit low, so we need to take care of the O2 as well. Now I mentioned that you can actually completely disable the O2 system if you want to. If you're a little bit more advanced in terms of the survival, this is something that you can do. I'm just going to recharge the battery a little bit and we're going to switch this back on. All you do is you release the O2 bottle, you um, press F and you click immediately to grab it. You vent some manually and then you just pop it back into the system. And now you'll see that we have enough O2 to last us through this event and we don't need to have the system switched on at all. We don't need to use any battery power. You can actually just disable that system completely if you want to. Um, the other thing that you're going to want to keep an eye on is the uh, pod temperature. So, so far it's not a problem yet, but you can see we're getting into the danger zone here. Um, to be frank, you can let it cool off even more and, and all you'll need to do in this case, it's a similar thing. Uh, you'll just open this up and we'll get rid of the power connector as well. So just get that out and you switch it on just for a little bit 
to get some temperature back into the pod. Um, only a little bit will actually be necessary here. You can then just switch it back off and probably just get this power connector back in to its original location. So you don't need to waste too much battery power on that. And that's it. That's how you deal with the electric event. That'll completely take care of it. Um, once all of this is done, of course, what you're going to do is you'll just gradually start switching systems back on again. So we can get the main power back, get the gravity back. Uh, next thing that will be useful, of course, we'll just have the lights back on. Um, it's going to take a little while for this to heat up back to the level that it needs to be, the main generator, so that it can generate power for everything again. Um, and then just make sure that you get one of these power connectors and you reconnect um, this system as well, uh, so that it's not constantly running off the battery. Uh, and then we'll just get the rest of the systems back on that we need to have functional. So this one, that one, the main computer, uh, temperature management as well. So it's just, this alarm is just going off because the temperature got really low, but it wasn't even close to the point where we would actually uh, die from that yet. And, um, and you'll just see slowly um, the atomic pile. So the blue line is basically the power that's being demanded here, and the red is what's being uh, generated. So it's just slowly catching back up to that. So like I said, Electric Nebula, probably the most devastating event for new players, very easy to deal with once you're used to it. And then of course, between events, you're always just gonna check again. We can see oxygen is getting a little bit low here. So we'll just switch that bottle back out and we do the same thing for the CO2 again. So just swap that around and clean out the filter again. Okay, next event. Uh, so the next one, I'm not gonna talk about the asteroid fields because really if you understand how the systems work, and I'll cover that at the end of this tutorial video, you know how to deal with the asteroid field. So we'll, we'll briefly talk about that at the end of the video. The Ice Nebula is the next one, probably the easiest event to deal with because you don't really need to do anything. What's going to happen with the Ice Nebula is the atomic pile temperature is just going to drop. And that means that you are just going to generate less power and certain systems are going to have to start running off batteries. So two things that you can do. The one thing is if you catch the event early, if once you see the warning, it's going to take a little while before the temperature actually starts dropping. And if you want to, you can just switch this system off so that the pot temperature actually starts slowly increasing. So if you look at this needle, uh, you'll start seeing that slowly rising. That'll get you a little bit extra temperature in the pod, which means that you'll have more time before you actually need to start using the system potentially off the battery just to increase the heat again. But it's actually very difficult to uh, freeze to death in this game. So it's not, it's not too hard uh, to deal with this particular event. Now, the other thing is, uh, systems are just going to start not having enough power to function. So again, what you want to make sure is that you switch off systems like the gravity generator and anything else really that you're not currently using. And uh, the only systems that you need to make sure you have power for, again, carbon dioxide scrubber, that should always be functioning. That can become a problem really quickly. And eventually when it gets too cold, you wanna make sure that you are switching on this system as well. So this one, it's that simple. That's how easy it is to deal with it. And once you're through the event, you just start switching systems on one by one as well. And just keep in mind that the atomic pile will not increase its temperature or its power output if the demand isn't increasing. So you can't just wait for it to go back to the normal level. You do actually need to switch on systems to get it back to the temperature um, that it needs to be. The only other way around that is to get rid of the processor in here. So what the processor does, and I always have trouble finding this, oh, it's back there. So the processor in this uh, always matches the heat that's being generated and the power that's being put out to the amount of um, power that's being requested. If you take that out, it'll just keep on increasing its temperature and keep on increasing the power output uh, until the point where you are basically gonna die from the heat in the pod. So of course you don't really wanna take this out. That is something that you can use to your advantage if you want to do that. But usually after the uh, cold event, you just wanna gradually switch systems on so that this can catch up with that. All right, so the next event that we're going to talk about is the red giant. So that's kind of the opposite. That's when things are going to get really hot in the pod. And there are basically 
just this one really important thing that you need to do, but there's a couple of other things that you can do around this as well. So first of all, you want to switch off the main generator as quickly as possible because this is going to be generating heat. And if you don't catch it fast enough, then it'll get to a point where you can't really deal with the event. So you want to make sure that this is switched off. Um, if you still have a little bit of time, maybe you can have this system switch off as well, just to let the temperature drop in the pod before. But to be honest, I would just recommend that you keep this system switched on throughout, make sure that it's got a battery in it um, to get through that hot event. So this will keep the pod cool. This will make sure that you don't have, if you have the generator disabled, that you don't get that additional heat and that's just gonna make it impossible for the temperature management system to keep things cool. So those are the two things that you need to do. And then of course, you just need to make sure any other critical systems are online. So again, you know, you could be manually venting O2. You need to make sure that you have that carbon dioxide system enabled as always, and you should be fine within that event as well. Um, now, before we get to sort of the systems check and how we deal with asteroids, we're just going to talk about the black hole as well. And in the current version of the game, what it's going to do is it will sort of create a gravity field that's going to draw all of your like loose items towards a certain point within the pod. Um, that's more annoying than anything else. It might pull open some of these drawers as well, as well at least in the uh, version of the game that I'm playing right now does that. So it's more annoying than anything else. The real problem that you're going to have to deal with is the fact that the pressure is going to start increasing. And once the pressure gets into the red range, it can start causing leaks within the pod. So um, two ways that you can deal with this. Uh, the first thing that you want to do is just re-enable this system. So make sure that the um, pressure generator is actually switched on and that will help to keep the pressure under control. If that's not doing enough, Something else that you can also do, and I wouldn't necessarily advise this unless you get into a difficult position where you have to do this, but you can just vent a little bit of atmosphere out through this uh, airlock. And you don't need to actually open the airlock, you can just uh, flip this, or you can just open it like this without actually pulling on the door. That will release uh, quite a bit of atmosphere already. Um, and you'll see here that we have actually lost some pressure. The only reason why you need to be careful of doing this is whatever atmosphere you're losing, you're losing nitrogen, oxygen, CO2 that you're never going to get back. So there's always going to be less in the system now. Not the end of the world. You can definitely um, still manage with less. Just be careful that you don't release too much in one go. So we're just going to switch these out, clean the filter again. You're constantly going to be doing that as you're playing. Um, and now I'm going to get to uh, how you're going to deal with asteroids. And, and that's really just about understanding the components within the pod and understanding uh, which systems, where you can swap parts out, when you need to repair, use the repair box, that kind of thing. So a couple of things. Uh, you need to always just be aware of where the fire extinguisher is. If a system does catch on fire, you need to get rid of that as soon as possible. It does massive damage. It's really difficult to deal with. The other one is the leak filler. If you are getting leaks, uh, just listen for that and look for it and try to plug those as soon as possible. Uh, you don't lose atmosphere that quickly, but if you just ignore it indefinitely or you have multiple leaks, again, you know, once you lose atmosphere, you can never really get it back. So then uh, there's just understanding what the components in a system does. And I think probably one of the best ones to look at would be the carbon dioxide scrubber. I also, I'm not sure if I mentioned this earlier in the video, but just be aware that um, if you look at systems like the main computer, this actually has two large processors. It only needs one. So there's a spare in here if you maybe need to replace the processor within the, the main generator as well. Um, so that's just something useful to know, but let's quickly run through all of the components in the system here. So what you need to keep in mind in terms of the power in the system, you need a power connector to get power from the main generator. Now the reason why you need a fuse and uh, a power transformer, think of the power transformer as your first line of defense against power surges or just having too much power being deployed to the system and the fuse would be the second line of defense. So if I switch off all of the other systems, the main generator is then going to channel all of its power into this system and what the power transformer is going to do is it will it will try to just maintain the right level of power, but it will heat up and eventually it will fail if you keep putting it under that stress. When the power transformer fails, 
The fuse, like I said, is going to be the second line of defense. That's going to fail, but it will shut off the system so that the rest of the system doesn't get damaged. So technically, if you have the perfect level of power output, you can run a system without having a fuse and without having a power transformer, but you don't really want to do that if it's connected to the power connector because as soon as there is a mismatch on the power, as soon as there's too much power coming in, the rest of the system will fail. Now, a useful thing to know is if any of these uh, components get damaged and there's no easy way for you to replace it. So let's just quickly simulate that. Um, so we're just going to switch this off and we'll just say like the fuse and the um, power transformer, these have broken and I can't quickly fix those. An easy way to get around that problem is just get rid of the power connector as well and just run the system off a battery. So if you just need a quick fix, you don't, if you have a battery in here, you don't need a power transformer or a fuse. Um, and that can really save your life in certain situations if you don't have the time or you don't have the components. This is also why it's useful to have a bunch of backup batteries because then if there's just one system that you're running off batteries, you can do that for quite a while. Uh, but we'll just get this system re-enabled uh, with the fuse and the power transformer and everything in here. Uh, so we spoke about these. A battery, it's pretty obvious what that does. You need both the filter and the pump to be functional for this system to work. The oxygen generator, it doesn't actually have a filter in it. But like I said, you can completely disable the system if you want to. Um, and then the rest of it, the data connector is pretty obvious. For you to be able to read uh, data on the CRT monitor, this needs to be connected. If I rip this off, you'll just see it says no data. I won't be able to see what's wrong. If it gets damaged, it may just screw up the display a little bit. The same is true for the CRT monitor. If it's damaged, sometimes it just makes it a little bit more difficult to read things, but you can still use it. But you'll need both of these to kind of diagnose a system and understand what's wrong. And then, of course, you have the power button. That's fairly obvious what it does. And you have the master caution, the master warning. Master caution would go on just for small things. It's not necessarily going to be something that's catastrophic, but it's just to make you aware that there might be a damaged component or something in here. If it's the master warning, it's usually going to be something like the CO2 levels in this case is too high, or if it's the oxygen system, it could be that the oxygen level is too low. So for each system, it's going to be corresponding to whatever that system is meant to do. Uh, so that's just in terms of the components that you need to use. And then this is probably the most important thing to understand. Let's just make sure these bottles are still at a good level. Yes, they are. So um, I think that, as I said earlier in the video, a lot of new players think that what you should do if something breaks, like let's just say, for example, the um, carbon dioxide system lost its fuse, like the fuse broke during one of the asteroid storms, and you now need to replace that. Uh, will take other components and then sacrifice that within the repair station. But what you've got to keep in mind is that the repair station gives you parts and you can then use those parts to fix things, but it's always going to give you less parts than what is used to make up that component in the first place. So it's actually a lot more efficient if, say, for example, the fuse in this were to break, to just take this fuse out and maybe use the fuse from another system that's not as critical or something like the emergency lights, even other systems that you know could be important but just not as critical as the CO2 system, just replace it and switch it back on. You should really only start using the repair station once you get into a position where you just don't have enough components going around for the critical systems that you want to use. And that's really all there is to it. From there, it's basically just practice. And this will give you a pretty good idea of you know, how to survive all of these events, as we've discussed, what the various different components do. And um, you should be able to, with a little bit of practice, like I said, get up to those hour plus survival times um, in the current build of the, the game. But yeah, I really like this game. I think it's fantastic. Like I said, I've been playing it since it uh, released in early access and it was the first videos on the channel. I thought I would make this updated video because there have been a number of changes that came to the game. And of course, I learned a lot since I made that initial tips and tricks video. If you do like this kind of content, please do like and subscribe. I have a lot of tin can content on this channel, a lot of other stuff. And uh, I'll see you for the next video.